International Harvest, the Lord has supreme reign. It, it is, is a church, church where I am taught and, and instructed in the ways of God. I will apply God's Word in my everyday life. And as a result of that application, there will be a transformation. At, At International, International Harvest, Harvest, I will be cultivated to grow and empowered to go as, as the Spirit of God enables me. The world that I live in shall be changed. My home, school, my workplace shall not be the same because of Jesus the Christ working in me and through me. Amen and amen. Welcome to International Harvest Christian Fellowship Church. Your word of the day is, don't brag about yourself. Let others praise you. Proverbs 27.2. And now for your morning announcements. Women of War, it's time to circle up. Join us for our very first Women of War digital experience. This year's theme is entitled Out of the Ashes and one you don't want to miss. Mark your calendar for September 26th at 10 a.m. Registration is now available on our website under the Upcoming Events tab. Ladies, let's circle up. It's time for battle. Join us on Monday and Wednesday for our prayer conference line. The number is 916-233-0790. The access code is 725-768. Bible study will be held on Wednesday night using the Zoom app. A video tutorial is available on our website. Children's church lessons are available each week for both preschool and grade school under the Watch Online tab. We're social. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel at International Harvest Christian Fellowship. And follow our Instagram at IHCF Church. There you'll find games, Many sermons, devotionals, and more. God loves a cheerful giver. Pay your tithes and offering online. Visit the website and click the donate tab. You can also text your donation to 817-435-4447. That concludes your announcements for the week. Thank you so much for listening and have a blessed day. I'm free indeed
chains are holding me It's who I choose to be well, We were singing that I honestly couldn't help But think about the times that I was bound It's who I choose to be The times where I chose to go the other direction where I, I didn't choose to run into your presence. I didn't choose to run to your feet. The times where pornography had me bound. And I'm being real right now. The times where I ran to marijuana for my peace. I didn't run to you. It's who I choose to be. And, I, and, and as I got further away from you, the less freedom I had, the more chains I had on me. No chains are holding me. But I, I, I truly thank you, Father, for your grace for never giving up on me, for always drawing me back to you. I'm free indeed. When I am without you, I don't have freedom, but in you, Lord, there is freedom. In your presence, there is freedom. I have to be in you. Without you, sin does have power over me, but with you, you have all authority, you have all power, you reign supreme, with you, you reign supreme. So Lord, I just thank you for your love, I thank you for your love, for your freedom, I thank you for your blood, I thank you for who you are, Father, you're worthy to be praised, you're worthy of my time, my obedience, Father, I thank you, and I give you glory in this place. our lesson from last week and if you would turn with me to Ephesians the second chapter we're going to once again break the bread of life as it's revealed in Ephesians chapter 2 let's begin by reading verses 1 through 10 and I'm reading from the New Living Translation this morning because it just puts it right down where we can understand it and the word of the Lord reads once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way following the passionate desires and inclination of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Verse 4. But God, who is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even when we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by grace that you have been saved. For he has raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly places because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all that he has done for us who united us with Christ Jesus. Verse 8. God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we've done so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things 
that he planned for us long ago. We want to continue in our lesson on this morning, in which we've entitled Maximize Grace. Maximize Grace. Let's look on to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and honor you for another opportunity to come into the house of the Lord, to break open the bread of life. I pray, Father God, for the hearer. I pray, Father, that you would open up the minds and the eyes of their understanding and open their hearts so they may receive the word of God today. And after we might, Father God, receive it, we may apply it in our lives, but it is the application of your word that produces transformation. And so we bless you and honor you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Maximize grace. Our lesson this morning is a continuation, once again, from last week's lesson, where we find the Apostle Paul that he writes to the church at Ephesus from a Roman prison cell. And as we mentioned on last week, this, this lesson has been deemed by biblical scholars as the first of the prison epistles. Biblical scholars also believe that this letter, this Ephesus letter, was a secretory letter, meaning that it was circulated to all of the churches throughout the city of Ephesus for the reason that we find it to be one of the most general letters that the Apostle Paul has ever written. And we say that because it involves no controversy it deals with no specific purpose, or no specific problems, rather. And most important, it addresses the faithful in Christ Jesus, which indicates that it is written with the global church in mind. And this really fascinates me. It, it fascinates me because Paul, who is sitting on death row in a Roman prison cell, operates from a kingdom mindset. He is, he, he, meaning that he is not concerned with his current situation in life, but rather he chooses to push kingdom agenda even though he's in jail. Amen. Impacting the church globally, and not only for his generation, but also even generations to come. What a mindset to have. Now, if God can use one man who is locked away in prison to impact the world across eons of ages, can you imagine what he could do if he could find a kingdom-focused people with a kingdom mindset pushing kingdom agenda in the earth? And this is the crux of what our lesson is about this morning. And so as I meditated on the text that I've read in your hearing, I was, I was drawn to a portion of scripture that speaks to one of the most profound subjects, one of the most profound opportunities, and one of the most profound or misunderstood concepts that is mentioned in all the scripture. And that has to do with this gift called grace. Amen. And it's evident to me that Paul is just so overwhelmed with the grace of God because he mentions it three times within the first ten verses in this Ephesus text. For instance, in verse 5 he says, For by grace are we saved. In verse 7 he, he says that we might show the exceeding riches of his grace. In verse 8, he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works. Least any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk therein. Now, on last week, I shared with you that over the last eight months, as I began to look at all of the things that are coming upon the earth, I have spent a lot of time thanking God for his grace. Amen. Amen. And I've learned, I've learned over the years to cherish this gift from God called grace. I've learned over the years 
not to take God's grace for granted. And everywhere I look within my life, and I don't know about your life, but within my life, I can see the works of his hand. Amen. Applying his grace. Not because I earned it. Because you can't earn God's grace. Not because I deserved it. Because no one deserves the grace of God. But because and simply because he is faithful. Amen. He, he's faithful to his word and he's faithful to his promise. So all we can really do is thank God for grace. And so when I think about the grace of God, I've come to understand that, that God's grace, his unmerited or, or undeserved favor, is an opportunity to be maximized. Amen. And it's been my observation that many of God's people take his grace for granted. And when you take God's grace for granted, it's clearly evident because it shows up within one's lifestyle, especially in the lives of those who live shabby lives. Thus, when we choose to live shabby lives, meaning lives that do not glorify God, amen, what we are doing is that we are taking God's grace for granted. Amen. And that's why Paul addresses this thought in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, when he wrote, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead in sin live any longer therein? In other words, don't minimize God's grace by living shabby lives. Maximize it. Why should we maximize it? Because our lives as Christians in the earth, and in particularly in this season, has the capability to make a powerful impact in the earth. Amen. Amen. Therefore, we must be intentional about pushing not our agenda, but kingdom agenda. Amen. And the best way to push kingdom agenda is to walk out our faith in shoe level. Amen. To live what we believe. Amen. That's how we, beloved, make a huge impact in the earth. Amen. That's how we make a huge impact for the kingdom of God. You know, interestingly enough, uh, last week I was approached on Facebook by a gentleman, amen, that, that offered a a friend request, and, and it turns out that I was stationed with this young man some 20 years ago when I was in the military. And in our conversation, he, he asked, hey, do you remember me? And of course, I, I remembered him because he was a bit of a problem child back during those days, and, 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 and as we began to reconnect, he said, listen, I want to tell you something. He said, I talk about you all the time. And I thought to myself, well, that's odd because, listen, it's, it's been 20 years, mind you, since I've, I've had any contact with him. He said, listen, I, I talk about you and I tell stories about you all the time. And I said, really? And he said, yes, he said, because I remember when I was a young kid in the military, just outside of regulation, had almost long hair, amen, arms full of tattoos, didn't really fit in the military uh, structure, amen. And uh, he said, I remember when the first sergeant tried to kick me out of the military. And I thought, this is what he said, he said, and I thought that he was going to be successful because the only person that would be able to defend me was a religious guy Amen. And, 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 and me being almost a hippie, and, and he, and he was speaking about me, and he being, amen, a religious guy, I knew he wasn't going to stand up for me. He said, but when we got before the first sergeant, he said, you stood there because you understood the regulations and how it read. 
and you defended me. You defended me, amen, and because you did that, I was able to maintain my military career. Now, I had forgotten all about that because even back in those days, uh, you know, my personality and my character was such to always try to represent Christ in everything, amen, that I did. But that young man over 20 years ago remembered, amen, something that made an impact in his life simply because, amen, I had a commitment with Jesus to walk open and honest in all things. And that's why the Bible tells us that it's important for us to let our light so shine. And before we got off, amen, that interaction, this is what he said. He said, in any case, he said, I'm glad to see that you're operating in your true calling. He said, maybe one of the only sermons that I can sit through is the one that you're preaching. Then he went on to talk about and ask about the location of the church and, and, and when we talked about some other things. But I just thought that was fascinating that seeds that were sown over 20 years ago is still giving life to others. Can you imagine, amen, how many people you have touched because you chose, amen, to walk and push kingdom agenda? That spoke volumes to me, amen, 20 years ago, and he's still having that conversation. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. He said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? He said, it is good for nothing but to be cast down and trampled underfoot. Verse 14, he said, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a basket or a lampstand, he says, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. Amen. In other words, beloved, we are the only Bible that some people will ever see. Paul said to the church at Corinth, amen, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, he said, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. That means that when people see you, how you carry yourselves, you are a living epistle. Amen. You're a living epistle. In verse 3, he says, clearly you are an epistle of Christ. Amen. Ministered by us, written not in ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. What type of impact are you making? What type of impact are, men, are, are, are you presenting for the cause of Christ? And so the question that is on the table this morning is how do we as believers allow God's grace to be maximized within our lives that others may see Christ in us. Amen. Christ in us. Jesus wants to be seen in the lives of the church. And this is Paul's message. This is the message that he's trying to get across to us this morning. This is what he means when he writes in Ephesians 2 and 1, and you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. And I want to I want to highlight amen the words and you which means that God in all of his goodness somehow saw fit to choose you and me amen in spite of ourselves because of grace. And what's so mind blowing about God is that he chose us. Not while, amen, we were living a good life, 
But he chose us when we were walking according to the course of this world. Amen. Amen. While we had the spirit of disobedience living on the inside of us and was by nature a child of wrath. Meaning God didn't wait for us to get it together. That's why Romans, amen, Romans 5 and 8 says, amen, God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. That's why we must maximize grace. Amen. That's why because of the grace of God, because we have been wooed and, and drawn into the love of God with his grace, while we are there, we should escort other people with our lives to the same door of grace, amen, that he pulled us into. Amen. That's what I mean by we have to maximize grace. Amen. Amen. So let's go ahead and finish walking through the text, amen, and we're going to move on to some other things that we didn't cover on last week. But let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 4. He said, but God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us to sit together in heavenly places. And so on last week, we said that these heavenly places, where we've been made to sit together in Christ Jesus, is a place of authority. Amen. You may recall that. And, and, and this place of authority is a spiritual rite of passage. This is where we left off. A spiritual rite of passage that only comes by the grace, amen, through Christ Jesus. And an understanding of this spiritual rite of passage grants me the authority, grants you the authority to cast off any and all hindrances that try to keep us bound, amen, and, and uh, uh, by, by hindering our freedom. That grace, amen, in Christ, amen, has set me free. In other words, old habits and hang-ups no longer have a legal right to keep me bound. I'm in Christ now. And these things no longer have power over me. Doesn't matter what you've been tangled in. Don't matter where you came from or what you came out of. When you are in Christ, you have a legal right to walk in the freedom and the liberty, amen, deliverance, I'll say it that way, for what Christ has provided. Therefore, I'm going to maximize the grace that Christ has given me. Christ has given me the right of passage in this new life. Amen. Amen. So, so you might ask, well, Pastor, what, what is a right of passage? That's, that's a very good question. A right of passage marks a time when a person reaches a new and significant change in their life. In the natural, we said that this change can be signified by conducting a ceremony, amen, for instance, a graduation or, 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 or a wedding. You know, the, the, these ceremonies signify that an individual has entered into a new seat and they have entered into a new place in their life. And because they've entered into this new place, amen, it provides new access. It provides new opportunities, amen. That's in the natural, but, but when we look at this in the spiritual sense, this is what happens, or this is what baptism represents in the life of a believer when they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It signifies that a spiritual change has taken place in the life of the individual who has received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Now, when we look at this aspect of, 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 of spiritual of, of right, of, I'm sorry, when we look at the natural, most rites of passages fall in three categories, three, three categories. For instance, number one, there is the separation phase. 
Number two, there is the transition phase. And number three, there is an incorporation phase, all right? Let me say that again. There's a separation phase, there's a transition phase, and then there's an incorporation phase. In the separation phase, the participant is separated from their familiar environment. Amen. They, they are separated from their, 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 their former roles. Amen. Their, 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 their families in some instance. Amen. Separated from what used to be. And then they enter in a very different and sometimes foreign routine that they are forced to adjust to. Amen. And become familiar with this new role. For example, when, 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 when I went into the military, amen, I entered into this phase, amen, of separation called basic training. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to get you to see something in the natural, and we're going to attach it to our spiritual life here in a moment. But I entered into, amen, a phase called basic training. This was the separation phase, amen, between a civilian life and a military lifestyle. And when I got to basic training, there were men and women from all walks of life there. Amen. Some were farmers, some were gangsters, some were homeless, some were rich, some were poor. Guess what? We was all there experiencing this separation phase from what was known as basic training. So likewise, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we enter into the family of God by going through the new birth process. Amen. You know, we, we, we heard the call of the Holy Spirit that says what? Come out from among them and be ye what? Separated, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And when we came, amen, to Christ, some of us were whoremongers, some of us were drunkards, some of us were liars and cheaters or thieves, some were just good, decent human beings, amen, uh, uh, as far as society's uh, uh, standard goes. But regardless as to what shape we found ourselves in, amen, we all came in need of a Savior and needed to be saved and sanctified and washed in the blood of the Lamb. Which means that we were separated, we were set apart, we were washed in Christ. Hence, amen, Christ gave us this rite of passage. Amen. So that was the separation phase. For when you go through the separation phase and you complete that separation phase, the next phase you go into is what's called the transition phase. And during the transition phase, Amen. The participants learn how to conduct themselves appropriately for the new stage of life that they are entering. And I'll use this military example for instance. Amen. In the military, the transitional phase from civilian life to military life, amen, was a process of breaking us down from the former lifestyle. Amen. We underwent certain disciplines and certain studies, amen, to break us down. Why? Because our former lifestyle was not conducive to where we were trying to go. And it took discipline, listen, we don't like to hear this word, flesh hates this word, it took discipline to get there. How did we get there? Through a process of military study and get this word, application. We had to apply what we learn, amen, in our military studies. And through the process of study and application, guess what happened? Eventually, transformation took place. Amen. amen. So let's bring this on into our spiritual life. When one becomes a Christian, there is a transitional process. Once I accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, there's a transitional process that we must continuously go through 
in order to be transformed from a worldly lifestyle to a godly lifestyle. Now, I'm not talking about working to get saved. I'm talking about allowing, amen, the Holy Spirit to bring us to this place that Christ might be formed in us. Friends, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2 tells us, 1 and 2, verse 1 and 2, Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us that we must present our bodies, what? A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is what? Our reasonable service. And then it goes on to say, and be not, what, transformed into this world, but be ye, what, transformed. Let me go back and get that right. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 says, tell, it tells us that we must present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, amen, and be not conformed to this world, amen, but be ye transformed, that's it transformed by the renewing of our minds that we might prove what that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God is. Amen. And so we must draw on our Christian discipline, prayer, study of the word, right fellowship as we go through this transition of being fashioned and formed into the image of Christ. So that we no longer walk the way we used to walk when we were outside of Christ. But now that we've taken on this, became made in the image of Christ through the blood of Jesus. So that I might be able to live a life, amen, holy and acceptable unto him. Romans said, it's our reasonable service. And so I'm no longer living this life only for me. But I'm living so that others might see Christ in me. The light of Christ in me will begin to draw and cause others to take notice that there's something different about this individual. Amen. Hence, my brother, that over 20 years ago, seeds were sown into him. And hence, he's still talking about it 20 years later. Amen. 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 And so as we as we as we draw on Christian disciplines, prayer, this is why prayer. Is important. Bible study, amen. Reading the word, it's important. Right fellowship, building right relationships, amen, is, is important, amen, as we walk in this transition. Application produces transformation, amen. You show me somebody that's not applying the word, and I'll show you somebody who's remaining the same. If you was mean when you entered into the body of Christ because you refused, amen, to apply, amen, the application of love, guess what? You still mean. This is how people can stay in church 30 years and no growth. They came to church mean and hateful because they don't, amen, apply the word of God, this aspect of, of love and unity. They still mean and hateful. You show me somebody that, 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 that hasn't changed, I'll show you somebody that's not working, is not applying the word of God. Because, listen, you can't hang around Jesus the right way and remain the same. You can't do it. Amen. And this process of transforming, amen, of transforming is a continual process. Guess what? We don't ever, we don't ever arrive. We have to continue because there's always more growth in Christ that is necessary in the hearts of God's people. Amen. We're talking about upward mobility. The closer I get to him, the more I fall off. Amen. Things fall off of me. That's why Paul could say in Galatians 2, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ Huh, that liveth within me. This is why he could sit in a Roman prison cell on death row and write a letter such as this and numerous other letters encouraging other people to come a little further in Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's take a look at this last phase and I'm going to read through here. This last phase to the rites of passage 
is what we call the incorporation phase. Now, without the transition phase, you cannot get to the incorporation phase, right? Remember our three phases, separation phase, transitional phase, incorporation phase. And so the incorporation phase takes place when the participant formally walks out their new role. In other words, they're living it out. They're doing more than talking at this stage. They're actually living out, amen, what they set out to be. They think it. They walk it. They talk it. They live it. For example, let's use the military example again. When we get through this phase, we literally become what we set out to be. In other words, if we train to be soldiers, guess what? We became soldiers. If we train to be Marines, we became Marines. If we became, amen, if we trained, amen, to be uh, sailors, amen, we became sailors. If we trained to be airmen, we became airmen. And we lived out this new role and our mindset totally changed. We no longer thought like civilians. We no longer live life like the civilians. Why? Because we were transformed into another vessel. Amen. Amen. And we were glad to do it and proud to become. Amen. Amen. Now, if we can go through this process in the natural and live it. How is it then that Christians can profess Christ and think and live and walk and talk something different? It's because we have not dedicated ourselves. We have not invested ourselves. We have not maximize the grace that God has given us. Amen. Amen. While we were yet sinners, Christ died, made our way, kept us from entering into a place of darkness where my grace was waiting until I woke up and saw that I needed a Savior. Amen. Amen. How do I thank God for what he has given me, I allow him to work in me. And I allow him to work through me. Amen. So saints of God, I, I, I simply come to let you know that in this season, in this season that we're living in right now, God has called the church to a high place in him. Amen. Amen. He, he has given us a spiritual right of passage in Christ, and it's imperative that we get there. Amen. 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 We have been called to maximize our position in the grace of God for the purpose of presenting Christ to the world. And I'm of this mind that there is a clarion call, a new mandate that has been placed upon the church in this season, given by God. We, we, we want to give, you know, the pandemic all of the credit for all of the changes, but God saw this pandemic before the eons and the ages before it ever showed up. He's still seated on the throne. How often God try to get us out, get, get our attention, but we're too busy doing our own thing. And so he uses opportunities such as this to arrest our minds, to arrest our attention. And I hope we've been maximizing our time with Christ during this season. Not filling our minds full of junk, watching this show and that show. Have we really spent time, have we really disciplined ourselves to prayer? Have we really disciplined ourselves to the study of the word of God? Have we really taken the time 
amen, to hear what is he saying to me. It's a new mandate placed on the church. You're a part of the church, therefore there's a new mandate placed on you. God is, is looking for you. He's, he's wanting to do something in you and through you. He want to use your life to touch lives around you. The world, although they don't know it, look to the church to present a loving Savior for the purpose of redemption. That's all Paul was trying to say in our text and our lesson this morning. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Not that out of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not by works, least any man should boast. But we are his workmen, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk therein. So I want to encourage you today to maximize the grace that God has given us. Maximize it. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and honor you for it. Another opportunity to stand and to minister the word of God. I pray that it found a resting place in the hearts of the hearer. I pray, Lord, that it gave us clear understanding, even given us purpose, or even the importance of why we must allow the Holy Spirit to continue to work in our hearts. I sense, Lord, that your return is soon. And our season in this earth must be spent pushing your agenda. That we might be able to bring as many souls into the kingdom as possible. So we yield our hearts, our minds to you today. And we ask, Lord, that you would shape, make, and mold us. Bring us to that place that we we'll allow you to form us into the image of Christ. We love you and honor you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Listen, beloved, you might be watching this particular broadcast. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But I want you to understand that there is no greater love, no greater love that you will find except for that which is in Christ Jesus. For he laid his life down that you and I might have eternal life. The Bible says that if you would confess with your mouth and believe in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ, that God raised him from the dead, he said, you shall, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believe unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation and just simply accept what Christ has done on our behalf. Don't worry about the living peace yet. That will come. He said take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. See we, we get the living right when we learn of him. Because the closer we get to him oh my goodness is when we really see how good he really is and it causes you to want to serve him even a more so. So I encourage you, amen, choose Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Beloved, last week we really enjoyed, amen, our outside fellowship. It was so such a blessing to be able to see everyone, amen, in fellowship. And we're looking forward to doing that again here in the next couple of weeks. Continue to keep, amen, us in prayer. Continue to pray for one another. Amen. That we may be able to get back in our church service. There's something about fellowship that is so sweet. Amen. Amen. In the family of God. And I certainly miss it and certainly look forward to doing that. God bless you. Maximize the grace of God in your life. And we'll be seeing you later on. God bless you. God bless you.